What's up guys, this is Xander Bennett coming to you with another top 10. This is going to be top 10 grass types today. Grass has always been a really interesting type in the trading card game and there are some really cool cards that we are going to talk through. If you want to get these cards on in paper or online, you can go check out Flipside Gaming and PTCGO Store. We have discount codes with them with using the code RAREcandy so you can easily get these cards available to you. But for this top 10, we have 10 cards as well as two honorable mentions. And our only real rule per se is that we do what we can to not repeat the same Pokemon on these top 10 lists. So overall, that's all that you need to get into it. And we're going to go through the top 10 grass types. Leave what you think in the comments of this video right now and see if you're right as we go through it. Coming in as our first honorable mention on this list, we're going to talk about two B drills that made up the Speed Drill or Lux Drill deck from the 2009 era. The first B drill is going to be a B drill from Rising Rivals. The relevant text here is that it has a pokey power called Flutter Wings that says once during your turn before you attack, you may search your deck for a grass type Pokemon, show it to your opponent and put it into your hand. So obviously a powerful engine piece that allows this other B drill to work. The B drill from Great Encounters has a attack for one grass energy called Band Attack that does 30 damage times the number of B drill you have in play. So the whole point of the deck was to get four B drills out and for one energy be swinging for 120 every single turn. You could do this very easily even if your B drills were knocked out because of cards like Night Maintenance, were, which was a super rod uh, from back in the day, and then also um, Rare Candy and Broken Time Space. Rare Candy's wording at that point was the old wording as you may have heard it referred to, that you can play it on the first turn of the game and on a Pokemon that was just put into play. So if you used your Night Maintenance and you shoveled back a Weedle, a Beedrill, and a Rare Candy, if you had two of the Flutter Wings in play, you can just search for both immediately, and if you have the Rare Candy, you can just put it back down. Then Broken Time Space being what is easily the best evolution enabler in the game, you could just go Weedle, Kakuna, Beedrill from your hand immediately and not have to worry about the Rare Candy. Alongside of those cards were Claydol that just allowed you to see much more of your deck and then uh, the innovation for the world's winning list from 2009 in the hands of Steven Silvestro was a 1-1 Luxray GL level X line, which had its powerful bright look ability or po uh, pokey power to bring up their bench Pokemon so you can knock them out with your Beedrill. The deck just has so much possible draws that you can do it. So Beedrill from Great Encounters and Rising Rivals coming here together to make a very powerful deck and that's going to be the first honorable mention on our list. Our second honorable mention on this list is Dark Crobat. And what's interesting about Dark Crobat is that there was both a playable Dark Crobat and a playable Crobat in this format, but they could not be played together because Dark Crobat needed to evolve from Dark Golbat and Crobat needed to evolve from a regular Golbat. So they could not really be played together. But let's talk through what these Pokemon do, the Dark Golbat and Crobat should sound pretty familiar to you. So Dark Golbat has the Poke Power Sneak Attack that says when you play Dark Golbat from your hand to evolve one of your Pokemon, you may choose one of your opponent's Pokemon. If you do, Dark Golbat does 10 damage to that Pokemon. Dark Crobat, very similarly, has Surprise Bite. When you play Dark Crobat from your hand, you may choose one of your opponent's Pokemon. This, po this power does 20 damage to that Pokemon. So... If it sounds like the Golbat and the Crobat that were released in Phantom Forces, it should. And very similarly to how those cards saw plenty of play, these did as well. The initial deck that Dark Crobat saw play with was with the Beat Up Sneasel that has seen play in so many different decks. We talked about it with Sloking, but for Dark Dark, you flip a coin for each one of your Pokemon in play. This attack does 20 damage times the number of heads, so you could set up mass so you wouldn't have to flip as many heads or you could finish up some knockouts on the bench. Another cool card that was played with these decks was a Dark Haunter. Dark Haunter has a attack for one Psychic called Callback. Put a baby Pokemon or basic Pokemon from your opponent's discard pile onto his or her bench. Put one damage counter on that Pokemon. So this is essentially a target whistle as an attack, which was a card that saw play with Crobat as well, funny enough, that would put a damage counter on it. So with relevant 30 HP basics in the format like Cleffa, you could put the Cleffa onto the bench, deal 10 to it, and then evolve into Dark Crobat and get rid of it as well. Um, there are very powerful cards in this format like Hyper Devolution Spray and Super Scoop Up 
that would allow you to reuse these Dark Crobats and Golbats. And just being able to use these powerful attacks on the active while you're also dealing damage onto the bench allowed you to take your six prizes really fast. There are some other neat innovations as well, um, such as cards like the Boss's Way, which would just allow you to search your deck for an evolution card with Dark in its name and put it into your hand so you had really great search for all of your Pokemon. And then there were also cards like Rocket's Minefield, but the deck was really powerful because you had very powerful trainers you could play alongside of it. For the Sneasel Crobat deck, everything in the deck has free retreat. Sneasel, Dark Crobat, Dark Golbat, Zubat, and Cleffa all have free retreat, and those are all of your basics. So you could just retreat back into Sneasel very easily. And then for the Haunter deck, if they chose anything that was not another Haunter or a Ghastly to evolve into Haunter, you could just retreat back into the Haunter that you wanted to use. In a very similar way to how the Landorus Crobat decks existed recently, these decks were very powerful back in the day, putting Dark Crobat as our second honorable mention on this list. Coming in at number 10 and starting off our top 10 list is Aselgore from Dark Explorers. Aselgore is a stage 1 90 HP grass Pokemon with the relevant attack being deck and cover. For a DCE, you do 50 damage and then a vending Pokemon is now paralyzed and poisoned. Shovel this Pokemon and all cards attached to it into your deck. So Aselgore has seen lots of play in different formats with all kinds of different partners using this deck and cover attack. Um, it started off its relevant tournament history in 2013, winning the United States National Championships in the hands of Edmund Kulos. And it really changed the world's format with so many decks putting in double Keldeo so they could get around this lock. Uh, the Gothitelle Excelgore deck that started off using this used Mew to loop Excelgore's attack every single turn, Mew EX, which has the ability Versatile that it can copy any attack in play as long as it has the proper energy requirements. So you just attach a DCE to Mew, use Deck and Cover, shuffle the Mew EX in the Double Colorless into your deck, and then you leave the Excelgore in play so that on your next turn you can use another Mew and a Double Colorless to continue this attack. In the meantime, you would send up a Gothitelle, so that Gothitelle would stop them from playing items so they could not play any switches or anything like that to get their Pokemon out of the active spot. You could make this lock be even stronger with Dusknor from Boundaries Crossed that has the ability Sinister Hand that allows you to move damage counters on your opponent's board freely. So the idea of the Gothitelle Excelgore deck was to get a Pokemon stuck active, just move the damage to their bench as much as you see fit, and then win the game in one turn by taking all six prizes so that you could, the lock would never get dropped, they would have that Pokemon stuck in the active. That was not the end for Trevenant, or for Excelgore, a uh, little bit of a slip right there, because Trevenant from X and Y came out, which was the same thing as Gothitelle, except on a stage one. Excelgore would have more spaces in the deck to be able to play Trevenant instead of having to play a stage two, it was able to play a stage one, and that's why that deck was able to succeed more in Expanded. Um, Gothitelle Excelgore and Trevenant Excelgore um, both had Worlds decks with, uh, in the 2013 was one of the few times they reached down to seniors, or they reached down to a top four deck from seniors with Ian Witten's Excelgore uh, Gothitelle deck being printed. And then in 2014, it was Trent Orndorff's deck, which he used in the 2014 World Championships to become the world champion. Outside of those though, uh, Excelgore has still gone to see some play uh, and expanded with Wobbuffet from Phantom Forces. Wobbuffet has a uh, ability that as long as it's active, bide barricade, no Pokemon in play have abilities except psychic Pokemon. So you could use this to shut off things like Keldeo that would be able to go to the active or other cards that would allow you to remove special conditions or block effects of attacks, and you would just loop Excelgore with Mew over and over again, using Floatstone to retreat your Wobbuffet, leave the Excelgore in play, and the only real out they would have would be a switch card. So relevant finishes for Wobbuffet Excelgore were a uh, top eight finish with the hands of Anthony Dimmons, good friend in Collinsville, Illinois in 2017, as well as in 2016, Mike Fouché got second at a regional in Philadelphia, losing to Jonathan Crespo playing Trevenant in the finals. So Excelgore overall saw a bunch of different play with different partners in multiple different formats, putting it at number 10 on our list. Coming in at number 9 on this list, and this discussion is going to sound relatively similar to the last one, is Vespaquin from Ancient Origins. Vespaquin 
is a stage one grass Pokemon with the relevant attack B Revenge, which does 20 damage plus 10 damage for each Pokemon in your discard pile. Um, we talked about Flareon on the last set review for Fire, and we're going to talk about Vespaquin here. This card is great. And the similarity to Excelgore is that it saw play with a bunch of different attackers as well. Vespaquin, as mentioned, initially saw play with Flareon, with Jimmy O'Brien going something like 24-0-2 between winning Lancaster Regionals in 2016 and then making Day 2 at 8-0-1 in the weekend later. Um, then later that year, Dalen Dockery got second at Collinsville Regionals with Vespaquin Flareon. And at this point, the decks sometimes were also playing Gallade as a partner with Maxis before that was banned. The deck then also made a transition into standard formats, where at the World Championships that year, Vespaquin got fourth in San Francisco, as well as seventh uh, in the hands of Lucas Schuster, playing it with Night March. So Night March with Vespaquin saw play at a different time, and then the fourth place was Ross Cawthon at that world. Continuing on later, the deck saw play with Zorark in the 2017 format, Zorark from Breakpoint, which had the attack for a double colorless Mind Jack, which did 10 plus 30 for each of their bench Pokemon. Uh, Vesquin Zorark got first at Madison, Wisconsin Regionals in the hands of Michael Pramawat, sixth in the hands of Jimmy Pendarvis, and 15th in the hands of Rahul Reddy, and then also showed up at the international stage with Alexander Hill getting ninth at London with Vespaquin Zebstrika. So Vespaquin just saw a bunch of different play with uh, different attackers. Jeffrey Chang got second at Seattle Regionals with Vespaquin Zorark. And overall, just being such a strong attacker with such efficient damage output, you had Battle Compressor in the expanded formats to make that work. There were also times where the decks were able to play Blacksmith so that you could get around different energy disruption partnered with Flareon so you had a better late game against some of the control control strategies being able to knock out a seismitoad with only seven pokemon in the discard pile was very relevant um, just because that's so easy to do with cards like unknown from ancient origins you could just get those in there freely but then also you had sycamore and juniper in those formats and ultra ball just to discard your cards so the deck just became this really powerful efficient non-gx deck that could take huge knockouts and even it made the flareon deck that was already seeing play even better because you just had more redundancy and more cards that not only could use the same attack, but were Pokemon that you were putting in your deck, so you're naturally in increasing your deck's ability to have more Pokemon in your discard pile. So with all that being said, in a long run of Vespaquin's great finishes, Vespaquin comes in here at number 9 on our list. Coming in at number 8 on our list is Yan Mega Prime. Yan Mega Prime is a stage 1 110 HP grass Pokemon, that sometimes we talk about these cards and it's just like one attack and that's the dominance of that card. This card, the entire text box is great. So we're gonna go through all of it. The Pokebody, the most relevant part of this card is Insight. If you have the same number of cards in your hand as your opponent, the attack cost of each of Yan Mega's attacks is zero. So all of these Yan Mega decks that we are going to talk about are relying on this ability or Pokebody to use Yan Mega's attacks. This is a very powerful effect and you had multiple different ways to get to the same hand size, such as Judge and Copycat, both being supporters that existed in the format. For the attacks, though, for Grass Colorless, you have Linear Attack, but this is normally just zero. Choose one of your opponent's Pokemon. This attack does 40 damage to that Pokemon, so this hits Benched Pokemon as well. And then for Grass, Grass Colorless, also normally zero. Sonic Boom for 70. This attack's damage isn't affected by weakness or resistance. Yan Mega had one of the most dominant seasons of all time after its printing. Looking at Nationals from 2011, Yan Mega was in all four decks that made top four in Masters, all four decks that made top four in Seniors, and also one Juniors in the hands of Xander Pro, playing a much more rogue version of the deck, being Yan Mega Vile Plume Ursaring Rose Raid. There's a bunch of cards we're gonna talk that we could talk about there, but we're gonna focus on some of the more established archetypes that played. Yan Mega. Yan Mega Magnezone is also one of the world's decks for this year, so if you've played 2011, you know about Yan Mega Magnezone. Magnezone has the Pokey Power Magnetic Draw, which says once during your turn, you can draw up until you have six cards. So this helped you match hand size very easily for exactly what your opponent had. If you had six, you could just, if they had six, you could just use it and attack. 
but if they have five cards in their hand and you have like a switch or a pokey power or something you can play before you would draw until you have six then just play the one card you get to five so the sequencing was very easy for this deck to figure out just how many cards do they have in their hand and it ended up being very strong um kyle sukovich also known as puka who now commentates for the pokemon company got seconded that nationals playing don fan yan mega zorark so don fan prime yan mega prime and zorark from black and white uh, this was just a very efficient stage one good cards attacker deck. Don Fan for one fighting did 60 and then 10 to all of your bench Pokemon. Yan Mega we just talked about. And then Zorark for a double colorless had the attack foul play where you could copy one of their attacks and use it. So it was really just a good cards deck that had a bunch of different options with all these different stage one Pokemon that you could use. Um, continuing on past the national championships for this year. The deck won juniors in the hands of Gustavo Wada and also was in the third and fourth place decks in the hands of Alex Kreckler and Joey Nawal. Then in seniors, the deck got second and third in the hands of Marco Facin and Grafton Roll and notably did not make any of the top four of Masters. Might have made top eight, but that info is not out somewhere that I could have found it. But Yen Mega just being such an efficient attacker for no energy allows you to put energies on your other Pokemon so that you could attack with big threats in the late game while still getting relevant damage on the board. And having 110 HP is not a ton for what we think now, but that's a large amount of HP for this format, especially whenever you're going to be going against yourself so often, you're not going to be getting knocked out immediately in return. You're going to be two-shotting, and if they go to the bench, you can use linear attack. So just being such a strong, powerful attacker that you didn't have to commit any energy to with no risk of not setting up, allows Yan Mega to get to number eight on our list. Coming in at number seven on our list is Muck from Fossil. Muck is a stage one 70 HP Pokemon with the Pokey Power Toxic Gas. Ignore all Pokemon powers other than Toxic Gases. This power stops working while Muck is affected by a special condition. This muck, if you thought that Garbotoxin was good, this is way better. Garbotoxin is a conditional effect like this, and this there's no condition. As soon as you put muck in play, all Pokemon powers are just stopped. So every deck that relies on this kind of effect just shuts it down. Uh, muck saw play in a lot of decks just to stop what the other decks were doing, very similar to Garbotoxin, but eventually became a staple to get around Dark Vileplume, which has the Pokemon power Hay Fever, no trainer cards can be played. This power stops working while Dark Vileplume is asleep, confused, or paralyzed. Um, the relevance of this wording is that back in the day, there were no supporter cards. Everything was a trainer. So all of your cards that we would now consider supporters, like Professor Oak, which you discard your hand and draw seven, or Bill, which allows you to draw two, or even other consistency cards like Computer Search and Item Finder, uh, which Item Finder is an old school dowsing machine, um, could not be played because you the shut down all trainers. So any kind of consistency that your deck had was shut off by Dark Vileplume unless you had a Muck in play to stop that Pokemon. Uh, Muck saw a play in decks very similar to big basic style decks uh, with popular partners being Wigglytuff with Do the Wave, Clefable with a metronome attack that allowed you to copy stuff on their active as well as Mewtwo, which would allow you to get energies from your discard pile and then swing for 40 a turn, which is a surprising amount of damage for Pokemon back in the day. Um, later on, Muck would continue to see play with those Pokemon, but would also see play with Steelix, um, as well as later on, Scizor and Furret coming out uh, closer to the E-card era. Um, the interesting thing about Muck is that there were some rulings that we would now consider bad that involved Muck. Um, if you had a basic Pokemon that had a Pokemon power and you put it into play while your opponent had a Muck, the current ruling at that time was that you could use that effect before having its ability shut off because uh, the company that originally made these cards was Wizards of the Coast, which uh, is also known for making Magic the Gathering. Magic the Gathering has this concept called the stack in which effects happen and resolve in a certain order. So if I put my basic down, I, as the active player, the player whose turn it is, can choose to use that Pokemon power before it gets shut off. Uh, this is a very similar ruling now to how something like Shaman or Daedane 
would work with Team Magma Secret Base and then the new Mimikyu that came out of Cosmic Eclipse. The difference there is that you are having two different effects happen on your Pokemon at the same time. You're getting the two damage counters and you're getting the ability. So of course you choose to use the ability first before the ability gets shut off by having the damage counters on it and Mimikyu. The ability should never exist with, or the Pokemon power should never exist with this card. And so it should be shut off from the beginning. But uh, cards like the Dark Golbat and Crobat that we talked about earlier would still be able to use their abilities because of how the wording is. Very weird and honestly uh, very relevant for things that were playing Muck. Uh, definitely would not be how the card works now, but if you are going back and playing decks from this format, uh, remember that. But even with that said, Muck is still very powerful because there were numerous Pokey powers that the ones that acted more like Pokey bodies that just exist, those would definitely get shut off. And just being a counter to Dark Vileplume, which was one of the strongest archetypes at the time, uh, or just decks that played Dark Vileplume, my bad, uh, would make it relevant enough to be on this list. So with all of that being said, and then multiple different decks that Muck was played in to shut off Pokemon powers, Muck comes in at number seven on the list. Coming in at number six on this list is Celebi Prime. Celebi Prime is a basic Pokemon with 60 HP from Triumphant, with the Poke Power Forest Breath once during your turn before you attack, if Celebi is your active Pokemon, you may attach a Grass Energy card from your hand to one of your Pokemon. This power cannot be used if Celebi is affected by a special condition. Um, that's basically the relevant text here outside of this card having one retreat. Celebi was a great enabler in the 2012 format because of being so many decks were playing multiple switching cards with Smeargle alongside of Skyro Bridge, which was a stadium card that uh, gave all your Pokemon one less retreat. And so the goal of these Celebi decks would be just to play a bunch of switching cards in one turn to switch into a Smeargle, use a secondary supporter from their hand with the portrait ability, then Skyro Bridge retreat into Celebi, use uh, this a power to put an energy into play, then you could junk arm for a switch and just continue looping as many of these switching methods as you can. Celebi saw play with a bunch of different partners because it would work very well with colorless attacks as well as just getting the colorless requirement out of the way for certain attacks. Then you just attach a different type of energy and you've already got your attack powered up. Celebi initially saw play with Tornadus from Emerging Powers and Mewtwo EX, which similar to how we said that Welder might be the number one card on the fire type list, Celebi might be this high up because of Mewtwo EX. Mewtwo EX for a double colorless energy has the X ball attack, which does 20 damage times the number of energy attached to both active Pokemon. So being able to get a fifth energy combined in these numbers to knock out their Mewtwo around cards like Eviolite was super necessary and Celebi was excellent at doing that. Once Darkrai EX got released in the next set, versions moved to running Terrakion, which became the CMT deck that so many people have heard of before in this format. Terrakion for Fighting Colorless does 30 plus 60 if one of your Pokemon was knocked out. So if you take a setup turn to put energy into play, it's really hard for them to knock out this Celebi or else they just get knocked out in return. So it forced the Darkrai player to do things like catcher up Pokemon so they can take multiple knockouts in a turn or uh, just have to play very awkwardly uh, the secondary attack on Terrakion meant that if they didn't knock out Terrakion the turn after you used it, you just got to do it again. For Fighting Fighting Colorless, you do uh, Land Crush for 90 damage. So Terrakion became a mainstay threat that more than just these decks ended up playing. There were different Terrakion Mewtwo decks that saw play. Terrakion was splashed into Electric decks to go up against the Darkrai decks. But uh, Celebi just became a very powerful threat. Um to enable these big attackers um, to knock out Pokemon in the 2012 format. The deck did receive a Worlds deck for the 2012 year uh, from Zachary Bakari being a Juniors Division semifinalist, uh, running all of the different attackers that we just mentioned. So Celebi Prime just being able to power up all of these different threats became so strong at putting it here at number six on our list. Coming in at number five on our list, we've got a few ultra rares back to back here. This first one is Verizian EX. Verizian EX is a basic 170 HP grass Pokemon with very relevant text. The ability is Verdant Wind. 
which said that your Pokemon in play that had grass energy attached to them could not be affected by special conditions. This was very relevant in this format because the main damage enhancer that existed was Hypnotoxic Laser, which would poison your active in combination with Verbank City Gym. It would allow poison to do three damage counters every single turn, and that was just not relevant for this deck at all. Um, multiple decks like TDK and Darkrai were using Hypnotoxic Laser to hit 170 by having uh, Dark Claw or later on Muscle Band alongside with Deoxys as a modifier or uh, Laser Bank to get to 170, and that was just not something that could happen with Verizian EX in play. The other <laughs> effect of this card is Emerald Slash, which for Grass Colorless, you did 50 damage, and then you could search your deck for two Grass Energy cards and attach them to one of your bench Pokemon. Shuffle your deck afterward. So this card was very strongly released in the same set as Genesect EX, and that became one of the biggest decks in this format, being VG or Virgin. Uh, Genesect EX for 170 HP Team Plasma Pokemon uh, EX, so they take two prizes when they knock it out. Didn't say that for Verzian either. Whenever you attach a Plasma Energy from your hand to this Pokemon, you may switch one of your opponent's benched Pokemon with his or her active. So this was super relevant because Catcher, right before this set was released, was just errated to be a coin flip. Pokemon Catcher used to just be switch one of your opponent's bench Pokemon with their active, but with the release of Plasma Blast, it became flip a coin if heads switch one of your opponent's benched Pokemon with their active. So Catcher got a lot worse and Genesect got a lot better uh, being slotted into obviously the VG decks, but the TDK decks, certain ones would play um, Genesect as well, just so they could have a Catcher effect on their Pokemon. Um, but then with both Megalocannon and G-Booster, the A-Spec, you just had huge damage and great numbers to be able to knock out Pokemon. The reason that Verizian is on this list instead of Genesect was because Verizian saw a handful of more play than Genesect did in its history. Verizian saw play in random decks across different formats just to not be affected by Hypnotoxic Laser. The Mega Rayquaza list that I used to top four Arizona played it. Different Night March decks even played it back way before all the crazy broken stuff came out when they were still playing Mew EX and Basics, they played Verizian. But there was also the Verizian Mewtwo deck that existed that would probably sound a lot similar to the CMT deck that you just attack at powered up Verizian, you use uh, its attack to put two energies onto a Mewtwo, then you just attach a DCE to Mewtwo, you attach Muscle Band, play lasers, and you just start swinging into stuff. Um, and it was also played alongside Raichu to get around different Pyro decks at the time. Verizian Genesect had such a dominant year in 2014 and later on into 2015, and also the beginnings of expanded Verizian Genesect saw a handful of play also. Um, back in those formats, regionals were day one standard, day two expanded. So not a lot of testing was done for expanded because you had to get through the standard rounds to even make it into the expanded portion. So a lot of people would just take their standard deck and just add in a few different cards that would help your consistency and then just play it. Um, so Verizian Genesect did actually see some play in both formats. Once Expanded got its own events, it was no longer relevant because the format was so powerful overall with other releases. But the most dominant performance of the Verizian Genesect was at Worlds 2014. Um, nationals of that year had Pyroar winning in the finals in the hands of Brandon Salazar, and Verizian Genesect was basically nowhere to be found. And everyone thought that there was no way it would see play just because Pyroar was so dominant. And then going into Worlds, six Verizian Genesects made top eight, with the finals being a mirror match between Andrew Estrada and Igor Costa, both having some differences in the lists, but six of this deck, which people thought was dead because of Pyroar, made top eight. Verizian, in combination with Genesect or different attackers, was strong, just being able to stop damage that would make it harder for them to knock you out but also just get so much energy in play on any attacker to knock out their Pokemon as you need. So Verizian EX comes in at number five on this list. Coming in at number four on our list is Glissopod GX. Glissopod is a stage one 210 HP Pokemon with three super awesome attacks. The most notable one for one grass is First Impression which does 30 plus if this Pokemon was on your bench and became your active this turn, 
does 90 more damage. So if you retreated or if you played a switch or if you played a Guzma or you Acer rolled your active and this became your active, you do 120 damage for one energy, which was very good in a lot of different two-shot metagames that existed while this card was illegal. Uh, continuing that, for Grass Double Colorless, you had Armor Press for 100, and during your opponent's next turn, this Pokemon takes 20 less damage from attacks. And then for Grass Double Colorless, you had Crossing Cut GX for 150, switch this Pokemon with one of your benched Pokemon. Galissapod GX was a monster, and the deck has so many finishes on Limitless TCG that I'm not even going to try to name off all of them. Uh, Tord Reklev started off this deck with a first place at the International in London right after Zorark GX was printed, but outside of that, the deck had eight regionals wins, four finals of a regional, five top fours in a regional, and 19 top eights in a regional. Then outside of Tord's win at the London Internationals, there was another international top four and two internationals top eight, and then a world's top eight in the hands of the God Slayer himself, Brian Miller in 2018. Um, so the deck just had a bunch of strong finishes. Being able to use Zorark's trade ability in both standard and expanded to just draw more cards, to have more ways to get the cards that you need while also playing impactful onboard supporters like Guzma and Acerola gave this deck a longevity that made it just have a much better late game than a lot of the aggressive decks at the time. If you couldn't beat the deck fast, the deck would beat you, and it didn't matter how long it took because they would win eventually. The deck went through many different variants, such as in different eras, it played Oranguru from Ultra Prism for resource management. Uh, it also played at certain points Enhanced Hammer, Counter Catcher, so that you, when you fell behind, because normally you're playing from behind, could just bring up their Pokemon and take whatever knockouts you want. The deck just had so much versatility in what it could do because you were seeing so many cards a turn and just had so many options with all the attacks on Glissapod. Every single attack on Glissapod was very usable and ended up being very strong throughout the entire formats that it was legal. Um, even seeing play at the beginning of Expanded in more fair, or the beginning of the Expanded with Zorark with more fair Zorark decks that weren't as focused on Skyfield because of the existence of Sudowoodo. There were also cards like Muck to get around that. So just kind of overall, um, Glissapod fell into favor in that format. Also as a counter to Archistois, so the deck saw play. The deck also was in two worlds decks. It was in the Glissapod Decidueye deck and the Glissapod Garbodor deck that were printed that year. Um, it was legal for a very short time with Forest of Giant Plants, so it didn't see a ton of play with that, but is mentionable. Um, and the deck just had so many strong options. There were even straight Galissapod decks that used Tabu Coco to flying flip and set up damage on your opponent's board and then would just go in with Galissapod GX um, being able to take as many knockouts as you could. And then also just having the Wimp Out Wimpod that even though it had three retreat on your first turn you could retreat it to the bench so that on your second turn of the game you could just bring it active with the Galissapod and knock out their Pokemon. So Galissapod GX just a very strong card where every piece of it helps out the deck, putting it at number four on the list. Coming in at number three on our list is Decidueye GX, the last ultra rare that is going to be on this list. Decidueye GX is a stage two 240 HP GX Pokemon that gives up two prizes with the ability Feather Arrow. Once during your turn, you may put two damage counters on one of your opponent's Pokemon. Then for Grass Double Colorless, you had Razor Leaf for a flat 90. And then for your GX attack, there was one Grass Hollow Hunt GX. Put three cards from your discard pile into your hand. Decidueye GX was a very successful card, initially in its own decks because of the existence of Forest of Giant Plants alongside of Vile Plume and cards like Shaman EX to help you draw through your deck and get it all set up but later on became a great support Pokemon with cards like Zorark, randomly, Galissapod sometimes, like in that Worlds deck that I mentioned before, and then also Ninetales in different variations. Decidueye came out in Sun and Moon and immediately made an impact in the finals of two different regionals uh, in the hands of John Kettler, but then would continue to be successful, netting overall, here's some more statistics, five regionals wins, four second places, seven top fours, eight or six top eights, 
And then at the international stage, which is why we have it higher than Glissopod, one win, three finals, three top fours, and four top eights, which Glissopod didn't do anywhere near that well on the international stage, though it did more at the regional stage. Um, Decidueye, just being able to spread out damage so well, made it one of the strongest decks going into the 2017 international championships in North America, um, continuing to be successful going later on into the year and into the expanded format. Um, eventually, Forest of Giant Plants was banned, which is why we saw a fallout of this card's success, but in standard, there was still the Zorark Decidueye Ninetales deck, which used trade, as well as both the Ninetales from Guardians Rising, which had the Ice Blade and Ice Path attacks, as well as the newer one from Lost Thunder, which would allow you to search your deck for two items and put them into your hand. So you could get some combination of Timer Balls and Rare Candies to get your Decidueyes onto the table to do a crazy amount of damage and set up excellent math for yourself. Decidueye is not a half too bad attacker on its own. It had a lot of HP with 240 HP, and you could just continue to use this Razor Leaf attack to two-shot most relevant things in the metagame. If you didn't two-shot it with just the attack, you had Feather Arrow to help you go the rest of the way. But the math checks out very fast with uh, Feather Arrow. It is a lot stronger than you can give it credit for just from looking at it, especially with tag teams now existing. Uh, 200 HP might or doing 200 damage might not sound like it's a big number, but back then being able to add up to high numbers like that made Decidueye very successful. With Zorark, if you had a choice band on your Zorark, you could knock out a Tapu Lele with just one Feather Arrow. If you need to do 190, two Feather Arrows would get you there. Uh, later on, certain decks would play Kakui as the HP increased, or if you had three Decidueye Snipes, which you could do over multiple different turns, then that would help you. So Decidueye was just an excellent math fixer for those decks that weren't attacking with it. And Razor Leaf and Hollow Hunt were still very good attacks. Decidueye had a lot of success on its own way before it was ever partnered with anything. And so with all these factors brought in, Decidueye puts itself number three on the list. Coming in at number two on our list is none other than the Scyther from Jungle. We we were very recent with the Sun and Moon block, and now we are going way back to one of the first sets ever printed with this Scyther. Scyther is a 70 HP basic, which is huge for a basic in this format. It's so funny to consider, but 70 HP was a very relevant amount of HP just because it was so much bigger than everything else that was around as a basic. Um, it sounds so laughable now, but this card was excellent, and so many decks were able to run it. Um, the attacks, for one Grass Energy, you had Swords Dance, which during your next turn, Scyther's Slash Attack does base damage 60 instead of 30, which is huge, <laughs> again, because if you have a plus power, you can knock out other Scythers as well as other threats in the metagame um, that were just very strong. Um, it sounds, I'm just laughing because I'm thinking back to how little damage that seems like it is, but it's a lot. And then for three colorless, you had slash for 30. Scyther was just the, the big basic that was relevant in this format. Decks back then played a lot more energy because of cards like energy removal and super energy removal. So playing extra grass energy in your deck to run Scyther was not at all a problem. And it had free retreat, so was no problem to splash into your deck so that you could just send it active and have it as a good attacker later on. Scyther was paired with so much stuff because it had a fighting resistance. One of the strongest Pokemon in this format was Hitmonchan, Hitmon Hitmonchan with a one fighting jab for 20 was very strong and that did zero damage to you as well. Um, one of the most famous decks of all time, Haymaker, ran this combination of cards, Electabuzz, Hitmonchan, and Scyther all together. So it saw play in original Haymaker decks, as well as alongside Wigglytuff. There were Mr. Mime Electabuzz decks that played Scyther. There were Licky Tongue Stall decks that uh, Licky Tongue had large HP for a basic, and you use Scyther to cover up your weakness against Hitmonchan. Scyther became such a relevant card in this format. There were decks that were running fire Pokemon just to be able to easily knock out Scythers. I cannot overstress how powerful a one grass, your next day attack does 60 damage to the 30, and then three colorless 30 is. Scyther easily makes it what's way up to number two on this list. Play some base set format if you've never tried it. This is a very strong, very powerful card. 
Coming in at number one on this list, if you were listening hard earlier, you may have caught it since we haven't talked about it, is Vile Plume in its many different iterations that shut off trainers. Uh, originally, it was the Dark Vile Plume that we mentioned earlier, but later on, there was a Vile Plume EX that shut off trainers if it was your active. There was the Vile Plume from Undaunted that shut off trainers, which at that point was translated to items if it was on your, if you had it in play. And then most recently, the Vile Plume from Ancient Origins, which stopped people from playing item cards. There are so many different cards that you could combine with these, so I'm going to kind of try to talk with them as a whole. They were very powerful with basics that didn't need anything else to get set up. Um, one of the biggest decks that exposed this was the Truth deck that Ross Cawthon used to get second at Worlds in 2011, using powerful cards like Twins to get your engine going, as well as Donphian Prime, and uh, Zekrom, you just had large HP Pokemon that they could not deal with because they couldn't really set up as well because you had gotten Vileplume out in play. Vileplume with Decidueye before the banning of Forest of Giant Plants was one of the most oppressive decks. There was even the Vespaquin Vileplume deck, which could very well deck itself out on turn one between playing Battle Compressors and Shaman to draw so many cards and just thinning out your deck. So much doing a bunch of damage with Vespaquin and then Vileplume would just sit there and make it so that they couldn't even play items to continue going through it. Um, items have historically been the strongest part of your deck in the trading card game. They are what help you get your deck going. They would help you set up. For a lot of decks recently, you can think about cards like Beast Ring or Hypnotoxic Laser. They are the enablers for your powerful strategies. Rare Candy cannot be played when there's Vileplume out. So, you're shutting down so many relevant aspects of these different decks, and that's why Vileplume makes its way to the top of the list. Um, it has never been a great attacker in any of these decks. It is never really meant to be an attacker. It has always just been meant to sit there and be very annoying while your opponent has to find a way to play the game without items. So very hard, oppressive thing to get over, and that's why Vileplume has seen play in every single form that it could where it was shutting down items for the opponent easily snatches the number one on this list. Well, with that concluding our top 10, thank you guys for listening to this video. If you like it, be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. It helps us out way more than you know. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, so you can find updates about our videos being posted there. Let me know if there's any other types you want to see, or if you want to see us move to a trainer card or something like that. If you already commented about how what you think was going to be in the top 10, put something down next to it. Did it line up? Was there something that you think that we missed? Let us know. And then again, make sure to check out our sponsors at Flipside Gaming and PTCGO Store so you can get some of these cards that you need to build out your collection of these super cool cards that have seen play throughout all of Pokemon's history. So with all that being said, my name is Xander Bennett. Sorry this top 10 was a little bit longer than our usual ones. I wish I could get these down more, but there's so much to talk about. Signing out with this top 10 grass Pokemon.